Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Beth Allen, and I'm a member of the Evo Endo sales team, and I will be moderating this evening. Uh, we have some quick housekeeping notes uh, before we get started. Um, this webinar is uh, scheduled to be for 90 minutes in length. We have reserved a lot of time during this um, for questions and discussion. Um, we're recording this town hall um, that was noted at the beginning of the hour. Um, speaking of questions, you can type them into the chat box down at the bottom or at the top of your, your screen by clicking on the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the viewing window. Only you and the panelists can see what you've actually typed in. We will then anonymously read them out loud to the group. Um, you can direct questions specifically to individuals and anybody that's participating in this webinar. Um, so everyone's line is automatically muted. Um, to keep the background noise and the feedback to a minimum. So please stay on mute to prevent any interference. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this of this session with all the registrants via email in the coming days. So please make sure to keep checking your inboxes. And that is if you opted in. Um, it will also be going up on our patient portal um, as well. Um, so everyone is aware, um, again, when we stop recording the Zoom call, the, it does automatically end the call. So it can be a little bit abrupt um, it, when it does stop recording. But as soon as your window closes, a survey is going to pop up. It's only about four or five questions. It should only take a few minutes to answer. And we would really appreciate your feedback because we do hope that this will be the first of many educational webinars to come. Um, but now with all that boring stuff out of the way, um, I'd like to introduce myself to you as well as all of our panelists who will be on the call with me today. Um, this is our very first family education town hall, so it is meant to be very interactive. Um, with me on the call today are our expert physicians, Pan Kreslep from Children's Mercy of Kansas City, Shauna Schroeder from Phoenix Children's Hospital, Matt Ryan from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, Kelly Worley, Child Life Specialist from Children's Hospital, um, excuse me, Children's Mercy of Kansas City, Clint Smith, who is a nurse and our clinical manager here at Evo Endo, Additionally, we also have uh, Ellen Kodroff from Cured, and she is the founder of Cured um, as a patient advocate, and Kathleen Sable, uh, Kathleen Sable, excuse me, patient advocate and retired board member representing AppFed. Um, so with that, again, everybody is available to answer questions, and please populate those into the Q&A section. And with that, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. So this is me, and if you need my contact information, that is my direct phone number. I do accept texts and uh, phone calls if you need anything. I do have um, additional account, uh, account directors across the United States. I'm always happy to direct you to the one nearest to you if you need to be in contact with them. Next slide, please. So um, my name again, Beth Allen. I am the moderator tonight working with you, but I do have a personal history with eosinophilic GI disorders. Um, I am a mother myself of a, of a patient. I have four children, uh, two boys ages 33 and 24, and then two girls ages 31 and 26, all adults. I'm a grandmother of two as well, a little girl by, uh, who is 11 and a grandson who is nine. My youngest son, who is 24, he's EOE, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, eosinophilic colitis. He also has a mitochondrial disorder. He uh, was diagnosed at 20 months. He had been on TPN. He was G-tube fed for 10 years, steroid dependent for five of those years. We used methotrexate, many other medications on top of that and landed on budesonide ultimately. Um, he's had more than 40 sedated procedures in his lifetime and he's had a lot of complications because of the mitochondrial disorder. Um, so I'm very passionate about this in addition to being on the sales team, but I am a patient advocate at heart. Um, more than a dozen hospitalizations as a result of post-endoscopy um, due to complications of anesthesia. He's very intolerant to that. And his adult transition, because of all of these things, has been very complicated for us as well. But he is doing well. He's the young man up there on the right in the photo of all four of my kids. So next slide, please. But that is my why. And I'm very, very passionate about these disorders as well as advocacy and this product uh, as a result of that. My professional history attached to that is I, um, in full disclosure, I'm one of the co-founders of AppFed. Uh, I was the acting president from 2001 through 2009. I worked on a lot of the early days of eosinophilic GI disorders, along with Ellen as well. She and I have known each other for uh, about 20 years now, maybe 21. 
um, a lot of the legislation, National Eucinophil Awareness Week that we all now um, celebrate together and recognize these disorders and promote awareness. Um, but, uh, you know, it is good to celebrate in some ways that we are we are a community and we, we do have um, codes now, which I was uh, a co-author on the original ICD-9 codes that were, were inducted uh, by the CDC back in 2009 as well. So I moved over to industry um, in 2010, and then I worked for QOL Medical in advocacy, physician relations, professional relations, and then on into sales from 2010 to 2018. And... Um, is for congenital sucrase isomaltase deficiency, which is a sugar disorder, a genetic. I then worked for Amicus Therapeutics uh, in neurology and some pretty devastating neurological disorders um, attached to that company, managing 14 different diseases with them. Um, came back to GI, my my beloved GI, and worked with Ivy Stim. Now, um, the product is Ivy Stim uh, for a company called Neuraxis from 2019 to 2021 ultimately joining Evo Endo in 2021, and I've been here ever since. And our, our one of our co-founders, Joel Friedlander, who I had known for, for quite a few years, I'd been following this product for quite a few, for many years, pretty much since the beginning when I first heard that he was doing transnasal. And it certainly piqued my interest due to my family interest and um, almost begged for a job <laughs> in how I could help. So it is my honor to be here. And this picture here actually is very reflective for me, um, it's from 2005, and it was the very first eosinophilic GI disorder large meeting at NASPGAN, and all of those physicians are champions in this space. You probably recognize some of them. Kevin Kelly on the left there, who wrote one of the earliest papers on using dietary therapy um, with man the management of these disorders. Uh, Dr. Leah Corris, Chris Leah Corris from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they now work together. Um, also a champion uh, in the early days, right there in front is Stephanie Harlow, who is a mother who has EOE herself and five sons with the disorder, one of the very first documented familial cases. Jerry Gleick, um, who is an allergist immunologist and a legend in our space um, in, in the amount of research and background of uh, eosinophilic uh, scientific research, myself, um, and then Dr. Glenn Feruda from Children's Colorado, um, and then Barry Warshall from Lurie Children's. And so that, that I, I chose that picture just because we've come a very, very long way from those early days to now. So um, it is an honor to, to work for this company and to be a part of this community. We're a very driven community and I'm very excited for this webinar. So welcome to all of you. Next slide, please. Moving on, I'd like to introduce you all to Kathleen Sable, who is a retired board member and a patient advocate from at Thank you, Beth. I'm very excited to be here again. My name is Kathleen Sable, and as Beth mentioned, I am a retired AbFed board member. I began volunteering for AbFed in 2005, so crossed Beth's path, although I did a lot of local work and support group work back then, and I joined the AbFed board of directors in 2012. My son was diagnosed in 1994 at six months of age. He will turn 30 at the end of um, this year and is doing very well. He was diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis and eosinophilic gastritis way back then. Abfed's excited to be a part of the future of therapy and to share a little bit about our advocacy organization this evening. Next slide. Actually, skip two slides. Sorry, I missed that first slide. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, AbFed is a 501c3 nonprofit patient advocacy organization that was founded in 2001, as Beth mentioned. Our mission focuses on five key areas, education, awareness, research, advocacy, and support. AbFed supports those with various subsets of eosinophil-associated disease. Eosinophil-associated disease can affect areas of the digestive tract, some we'll be talking about mostly this evening, such as the esophagus, but it also can affect other parts of the body, such as the lungs, the respiratory tract, connective tissues, just to name a few. Our members of ABVET are people of all ages and in all stages in their journey with the eosinophil associated disease. And although many of our initiatives are specific to the US, we do have a global following and work with sister organizations from around the world. Next slide. 
Education and awareness form the foundation of AppFed's mission. We educate patients, doctors, and the public about diagnostics, treatments, and research advances through a variety of platforms, both in person and virtual. Every summer, we host an annual conference for patients and families. In 2024, the annual conference will be in Washington, D.C. We're very excited to be there tentatively July 11th through 13th, so mark your calendars. We have a webinar series that gives patients and caregivers and others the opportunity to learn year-round from presenters and guests on a variety of topics such as diagnostics, treatments, and practical strategies for living. Methods podcast series, Real Talk Eosinophilic Diseases, features conversations with patients, clinicians, and researchers about living with the eosinophil-associated diseases, and it features advances in the field. You can find it on AppFed's website or pad podcast platforms like Apple and Spotify. Education goes hand in hand with awareness, and we work to raise awareness among healthcare providers so that they can more readily recognize symptoms that might warrant treatment or a referral to a specialist. Next slide. AppFed's role in research is another crucial arm of our mission. AppFed has a strong research grant program that is funded entirely by community donations. This enables us to accept research proposals for funding consideration. This summer, we were excited to announce we are awarding $200,000 to support new research, perhaps helping to find new ways to potentially treat eosinophilic-associated diseases. You can learn more about projects that AppFed has funded on our website at appfed.org. AppFed also brings the patient voice to research, provides feedback on research design and protocols, assists with selection, manuscript development, and dissemination to the community. Next slide. The next arm of AppFed's mission is advocacy. AppFed has been a leader and on the forefront of critical advocacy initiatives. These include documenting unmet needs of our community and the barriers to care. By understanding where the pain points are in a patient's journey, we can then work to address them and improve care and quality of life. Some examples of advocacy initiatives that we've been involved or led include the establishment of medical ICD codes for various subsets of eosinophilic disease, that is to ICD-9 when Beth was involved in ICD-10, which is work that I did insurance coverage for medical foods, informing the FDA of patient needs, contributed to, uh, contributing to key reports for policymakers, and establishing a National Awareness Week through a congressional bill passed by the U.S. House of Representatives. You can see Beth and I have a little bit of crossed history. <laughs> um, next slide, please. As an advocacy organization, our focus is the patient community. We are here to provide meaningful support and we help patients connect with healthcare providers through our website, Specialist Finder, and foster interactions between patients and families. Next slide. You can learn a lot more about AppFed, our progress this year, and about EID, EADs by registering for recorded conference sessions free of charge. Next slide. The AppFed website offers easy navigation, access to information on events, and assistance finding physicians to help you with your specific need in your local area. You can learn more about AppFed on our social media accounts and connect with over 20,000 others on the online Inspire community. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. We definitely have a lot of history behind us. Um, <laughs> and you are one of the originals from way back in the 90s. So thank you for that. Up next, I would like to um, introduce Ellen Kodroff, who is the president and founder of Cured, um, also a very driven patient advocate on our team. Hi, everybody. I want to thank you also for allowing me to speak and share about the Cured Foundation and my passion to do what we've done for the past 20 years. As we all know, the diagnosis changed our lives as I'm sure it changed many of yours. In January, 2003, my daughter, Jory, was diagnosed with eosinophilic diseases throughout her digestive system and also hyper eosinophilic syndrome. At that time, we were at a loss 
We didn't know where to turn, and our journey ended up taking us to Cincinnati Children's Hospital for treatment. My not knowing much about research and how research worked, I was really surprised to know that there wasn't a good treatment or medications that were FDA approved for this disease. And I, I guess I just always assumed that research was funded through hospitals and that's how research got moved and advanced. And I found out that wasn't the case, that most researchers need to find their own funding and their own funds to be able to do their research. And leaving Cincinnati after our first treatment, I vowed to go home and try and make a difference and raise some funds for research. At that point, I asked my family and friends to please help me put together a foundation and as Cured States campaign urging research for eosinophilic diseases, Cured was formed. And at this point, I am very honored and excited to share that by the end of this year, CURED will have donated $7 million to research in hope of a better cure, a hope of a better treatment and hopefully a cure as well as better diagnostic tools. Um, CURED's mission is CURED is also a non-for-profit 50C3 foundation dedicated to those suffering from eosinophilic gastrointestinal diseases, including EOE, EOG, and EOC, and other eosinophilic diseases. CURED is committed to raising substantial funding to aid in research, advocating on behalf behalf of EGID patients and their families and working to educate and increase awareness about this complex group of diseases. It is our heartfelt belief that CARE can make a difference for the individuals and their families who are touched by these diseases. This year alone, CURED has committed to donate close to $700,000. And I'm proud to say that by the end of December, we will have met those goals and, and those donation amounts to various different research centers across the US. CURED is passionate, obviously, about fundraising. And the way we do fundraising is through individual fundraisers, through email campaigns, through social media, and always happy to speak to others about how they can help and get involved and help us to meet these goals of grants that we commit to fulfill. We host a biannual research conference. We hope to educate doctors, physicians, researchers, and patients from around the world. Our last conference in 2019, prior to COVID, we had um, all of those doctors, researchers, patients from nine countries in almost every state in the US. And we are working right now on preparing for our 2024 conference, which will be held April 5th through 7th in Cincinnati. And you can actually register now. Registration is live on our website, www.curedfoundation.org. Raising awareness is a crucial part of what CURE does. We raise awareness by being on television, news stations, newspapers, magazines, social media, any way that we could think of to get the word out. Not only does it help patients and their families to understand the disease better, but it also helps our friends and family and people in our communities who have symptoms and don't have a diagnosis. So. Awareness obviously creates so many different things. CURED is always available to work with patients, to help support them, to just be a shoulder to cry on, to be somebody to listen to. I know that when I started this journey, I felt very alone. So between myself and Shay Kyle, who is probably in the audience listening right now, between the two of us, we're committed. We talk to patients and family members 24 seven. We're always willing to help. So as my phone number was listed on the first slide, you can email me, you can call me. I'm always happy to talk and be of as much support as I can. And if I can't answer your questions, I'm always happy to find somebody who will be able to answer your questions. 
Kirit has funded, I believe, 12 or 13 now different research centers, along with also funding different projects to have better diagnostic tools, um, including the Eva Wendo and the TNE. We um, started working with Joel at pretty much his beginning stages and were able to help fund this project. So we really believe in this company and this product. We know, like Beth mentioned, there are so many patients who can't be put under or it's a struggle to be put under. I know my daughter alone has had over 40 endoscopies and we definitely need different diagnostic tools so that doesn't happen. Um, just to end, like I said, we are always here from you from Cured and very, very proud to say by December and by the end of this year, Cured will have donated $7 million towards research. We are 100% volunteer staff and Cured is changing lives with those patients living with an EGID. So very happy to be here and thank you and always happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Alan. Um, I appreciate both advocacy organizations being on the call and they are here for you. And um, a big part of their, their presence is that um, anybody that may have come across this webinar has access to support mechanisms via both organizations. And so they are here for you and you're free to reach out to them or ask questions in, in the Q&A for them as well. Up next, joining us is Clint Smith, who is a registered nurse. He is our clinical specialist manager, um, and I will turn it over to you, Clint. Thank you, Beth, and thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I'm so glad you all are here with us to hear from these amazing physicians, all of whom I've had the pleasure of working with, as well as their TNE teams. As Beth said, my name is Clint Smith, and I'm a nurse that works with Evo Endo as a clinical specialist manager. Prior to joining the Evo Endo team, I worked at Children's Hospital of Colorado alongside Dr. Joel Friedlander, uh, one of Evo Endo's co-founders, and, and we worked together there to build the first pediatric sedation-free transnasal endoscopy program, um, and I've been involved directly there supporting over a thousand TNEs. Um, we also help support other medical centers and teams who wanted to start their own sedation-free programs because we felt this is an amazing option for patients and figured the more people doing it, the better. Uh, at that time, we were using an off-label device for sedation-free transnasal endoscopy as we needed something small enough to fit in our pediatric patients' noses. It worked great, but it had its limitations. Next slide, please. So that's why Dr. Friedlander and our other co-founders created Evo Endo as a startup in 2017. Through a team approach and collaborative effort, we aim to bring our experiences, ideas, and new devices to patients and providers around the world. Our team at Evo Endo is dedicated to improving patient care by bringing a sedation-free endoscopy experience to patients and their providers. Our team's dream became a reality when Evo Endo's ultra-slim endoscopy system was granted FDA clearance for uses in patients ages 5 and up last year. Now, we know that for a patient, a room full of lots of different medical equipment, machines, devices, multiple people you don't know wearing masks can be a little scary or intimidating, and we wanted to create as pleasant an experience and as simple as a system as possible. Our system utilizes an ultra-portable controller that's less than two pounds. It's that little blue box there on top of the cart, so it's not very intimidating. The patient here is wearing the Evo Endo virtual reality goggles, and these enable them to watch a movie or a TV show during the procedure to help distract them. The procedure can be pretty short, so I usually would recommend and, you know, they watch a TV show because usually you're not getting through the movie credits before the procedure's done because it doesn't take that long. Um, there's even been patients asking if they could watch the actual procedure, you know, being done. But unfortunately, that's not an option yet. Um, however, you know, since there's no anesthesia, as soon as you're done, your provider can show you the pictures or even a video and describe everything they saw. Also, those VR goggles are single use, which means the patient can take them home. So a nice little prize at the end of the day. Um, just make sure they leave the phone so the team can, team can use it for the next one. Now, finally, you can see what I consider one of the best looking medical device models there holding the scope. Um, now, this scope was developed to be the, the one scope to rule them all, as Dr. Friedlander and I would joke about. It's a device that would make up for 
the limitations of the, by the device he originally used for TNE, which was a bronchoscope, which was used by the pulmonary doctors to look at the lungs. The length of the scope, it's 110 centimeters, which is the same as traditional gastroscopes. And this enables providers to perform full EGDs based on a patient's needs. So they, they can look in the esophagus, go to the stomach, or even into the small intestine. And it's small enough where they can go through the nose and you don't need anesthesia, so it's sedation free. The device also has a channel or an open tube through the middle that enables the endoscopist to obtain biopsies or do other tests that may be needed. And so the scope is able to navigate the upper GI tract with the full capabilities and functionality of a much larger gastroscope, but again, not needing anesthesia. Next slide, please. Now, I like this picture here as it gives a good visual comparison of Evoendo's gastroscope to other transnasal gastroscopes that could be used. As I said, we wanted to try to improve the transnasal experience, and what better way to do this than to make as small of a scope as you can to be able to do what a big scope can do. We at Evoendo say we do big things with small scopes. Now, the Evoendo gastroscope is 3.5 millimeters in diameter, so it's about the size of a cooked piece of spaghetti like Bucatani or excuse me, Bucatini, mispronounced that, uh, where traditional transnasal gastroscopes are around five millimeters or bigger in size, which is about the size of a drinking straw. So the simple question here is, which of these would you prefer to have in your nose? And when I would talk to our patients about sedation-free T&E, I like to ask them, you know, which finger do they use to pick their nose and go ahead and stick it up as far as they can and then compare their finger to the side of the scope, which is very, very small compared to that, that finger that they're jamming way up there. Next slide, please. Now, the Evo Endo family is dedicated to providing the services and tools to help others evolve their patient's sedated experience to sedation-free, while also working to improve the patient and provider experience. Evo Endo is in 25 hospitals nationwide with more about to start, all with the goal of bringing the option of sedation-free endoscopy to their patients. Close to 350 cases have now been performed around the United States with the Evo Endo system, which means 350 times a patient did not need anesthesia, and we think that's amazing, and that number will continue to grow. So again, I want to say thank you guys for being here and for your time and you're going to hear from some amazing people talking about their experiences thank you so much clint up next um, we have kelly worley who's a certified child life specialist from children's mercy of kansas city kelly thank you for joining us yeah thank you beth i am super happy to be part of this panel today to talk about kind of more the patient focused family focused side of t &E procedures. And for those of you who maybe don't know what a child life specialist is, we are a part of the healthcare team and we specialize in helping children and families navigate their healthcare experiences. So our educational background um, is kind of in the child development side and our um, primary focus is on the psychosocial needs of the patient in the hospital setting. So with that, we use appropriate age appropriate language to prepare patients for procedures. So with that, we show them pictures, we get to show them the real medical items. Um, we give them a chance to ask us questions and manipulate those things. Um, and we also support them by helping them to come up with what we call a coping plan um, to help them throughout their procedure. And I'll talk a little bit more about what a coping plan is. Um, but first, I want to kind of walk you through kind of what I do to help the patients that are coming to our TNE clinic at Children's Mercy. Um, about a week or two before their scheduled appointment, I will send out a portal message. And this is a message that goes through their medical chart. It helps to explain my role. And also, I attach a link with a prep book. And this prep book is um, pictures and wording that kind of has all the steps of the t &E process. So it gives them a chance to kind of on their own time, look it over. Um, and it also gives them a way to contact us or reach back out through their chart messaging um, or through their medical chart um, with any questions. So I can respond back and forth. If there's anything that comes, a question that becomes more medical related, I can even link in the nurse to help answer some questions. So it's a great way for them to kind of get some questions answered ahead of time. Um, and then sometimes I don't hear from families. So if I don't, I try and reach out and make a phone call to them about a week before their appointment. During that phone call, I'm kind of looking to see if they've had a chance to look at my prep materials, if they have any questions, if their patient or their child um, has any questions about anything, or maybe just how they're feeling about 
you know, being having this procedure done. So I can really find out a lot with a simple phone call that maybe is five, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then on the day of the procedure, I get to meet them, uh, the, both the child and the parent. And then that day I can kind of assess how they're doing, how they're feeling, ask them some real um, basic questions about, you know, what maybe are stress points for them that they're thinking about with this procedure and maybe ways that I can help them, you know, feel a little bit more comfortable with it happening. Um, you know, we kind of are working with these preteens, mostly preteens and teens. And I know they're a lot of times worried about their body image and some of the things that are, um, you know, happening with their bodies. So I always like to talk about some of the different bodily functions that maybe can happen um, as they're getting scopes um, where they may feel like they need to burp or maybe feel like spitting would be something that they would want to do. So I always want to bring those types of things up and at, at least let them know that, you know, everyone's a little bit different, but really want to normalize all of those things that could happen during um, their t &E, uh, procedure. And then we'll kind of kind of coming back to that coping plan. Um, and really a coping plan is just offering realistic choices of things um, that they can do during the procedure to really ideally make it much easier for that patient. So as you saw in those slides that Clint um, had, there are those virtual reality goggles. So that is a way to provide great distraction and really an alternate focus. So they'll really concentrate and hopefully, you know, really zone in on that movie or that show, and it will help um, them not really focus on what's going on so much with their body. Obviously, they we can talk with them and they can talk back. And for some kids, talking is a great way to kind of help them cope if they want to talk about what they're watching. Um, I also utilize stress balls a lot as a way for them to squeeze it or some kids have brought stuffed animals so always encouraging those things that are a comfort item or something that will help them in uh, a moment where they're feeling maybe a little bit more pressure um, they could squeeze that ball and it still helps them to stay real calm and and really hold still for that procedure um, some of our younger parent patients like to hold a parent's hand um, so we always make sure that they know that a parent could do that if, if that is something that would help them. And also just those slow, deep breaths, um, any way to keep their body kind of calm is really what we're looking for as we, um, are, are, you know, helping them through this process. Um, so these are some of the things that I do and help in helping our patients and families kind of prepare for the t &E process. And I would just, uh, kind of say advocate for a child life to be involved with your child if if they're kind of going to have any medical experiences or t &E, um, in the future. And I know at our hospital, we don't, you don't have to pay for our services. I'm sure it's like that at most hospitals, but just so you know, we, we love working with patients and families and, and helping them be successful with the different things they have to encounter in the hospital setting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. I think I can certainly speak for so many parents as I'm watching nodding heads and things like that in the audience is that child life is, is a crucial part of our, our medical journeys. And so we're all very grateful and we're very grateful for your, your ability to be on this call with all of us. So thank you for that. Next slide, please. And up next, we are now uh, welcoming our, our expert panel of physicians. And uh, joining us is Shauna Schroeder, who is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Phoenix Children's Hospital. Shauna, thank you and welcome. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation to come and talk about my experience tonight. Um, a little background about me. I um, am a pediatric trained um, physician. I was out in the East Coast for residency and then off for fellowship um, at Children's Colorado. And after um, I spent my time in the lab for two years doing EGID research, I realized that there were a lot of patients coming up from the South in Arizona to get their treatment. So I reached out to the people at Phoenix Children's and asked if they wanted an EGID program. And I've been here for 12 years growing our EGID program as well as now more focused in less invasive testing and surveillance for our patients with EGIDs. Um, 
back in 2019, um, I had an opportunity to apply for a grant from the PCH Foundation. And I had donors um, start me off with some money, which was so generous and kind um, because there were page, patient interest in having transnasal endoscopy here at PCH. Um, I uh, was able to purchase a, a bronchoscope that we had previously talked about as well as um, an ex, which is expensive as well as a um, tower, which is also expensive. And so I really started uh, down transnasal endoscopy right before COVID in 2019. I had the opportunity to go out to Denver and watch um, Dr. Freelander perform scopes. Um, and then I came back here and performed a few scopes on some volunteers that were endotechs and endo nurses downstairs. And then I started doing transnasal endoscopy on patients pretty much right after. Um, COVID sort of put a stop to the train of moving forward for a good six months and then restarted again. And then the company Evo Endo and Dr. Freelander reached out when they got FDA approval for the ultra slim gastroscope. And I was able um, to be part of the first group of physicians that actually got their hands on the scope and perform on patients um, live and in person. And um, so far, um, my clinic I run is a monthly clinic and I usually will scope anywhere between eight and nine patients scheduled um, for a full day scoping session. And um, the feedback that I've gotten so far from patients is that they extremely appreciate the unsedated um, procedure. Um, they're well prepared um, with videos that can be watched from Evo Endo um, and other sites that have some YouTube videos. And we also will call um, patients prior to their visits to make sure that they're on their treatment that they're supposed to be on and answer any questions um, and provide them with those resources prior to coming to the clinic visit. Um, I typically will give them, uh, half my patients probably use VR for dissociation. Um, the other half like to see or be more aware of what's going on. Um, and I will give them a big popsicle at the end. And I would say the vast majority of the patients would repeat and, and they have another unsedated transnasal endoscopy. Um, although I don't ask them that day if they would want to do it again. <laughs> so anyway, that's been my experience. Um, I've done about 200, I would think over the last two and a half, three years. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Schroeder, very, very much. And up next, we have Dr. Matt Ryan from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who is uh, wonderfully joining us as well. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. And I'd like to thank uh, Aptid, Cured, and Evo Endo for hosting the event tonight and inviting us. Um, I came to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia as a pediatric GI trainee in 2003. And honestly, my first uh, venture into pediatric GI was more of doing liver research for many years. And I'm not one of the panel who does a lot of EGID work. I'm actually one of the leads in the airway center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia taking care of aerodigestive disorders. But in doing that, I worked very closely with a lot of otolaryngologists, ENT doctors, who if somebody has uh, a vocal cord issue, hoarseness, they just take a scope, they look down the nose and they do it right there in the office. And I was like, oh my goodness, what are we doing wrong? Where I see a patient that takes four weeks to book somebody in, they go under anesthesia, they take recovery time. So I had the good fortune of knowing Dr. Joel Friedlander from his time of training at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So it wasn't a big leap for me to, once I learned he was doing these procedures in Colorado, to call him up and say, hey, can I come out there, watch you and Clint Smith in action? And I did that in 2017. Um, after clearing some hurdles, we did our first transnasal endoscopies in 2019. And as Shauna was saying, it was kind of unfortunate timing and the COVID, a pandemic that affects the nose, throat and everything like that hit four months later. But um, we, we moved on through it. We initially started with the bronchoscope as well and then moved to the uh, disposable gastroscope from Evo Endo. And it's been, it's been wonderful. We get patients from up and down the East Coast here doing this. And we've also done uh, probably over 200 procedures at this point. Um, 
and the patients like it. The patients come back for it. Um, it's been a wonderful tool in our toolbox, and I think they're appreciative that we're willing to give them options in ways they could have their disease evaluated and managed. So, um, you know, that's been my experience with it, and I look forward to doing many more scopes. Thank you so much, Dr. Ryan. Really appreciate that. And um, up next, we have Dr. Pang Kresslep from Children's Hospital, uh, Children's Mercy Hospital, excuse me, in Kansas City. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. All right. Hi, everyone. First, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Cure Effort, and Yvonne Lo for giving me the opportunity to be here today to learn all the inspiring stories and focusing work from Beth, Kathleen, and Ellen. This is so inspiring. My name is Pan Krasalov, and I'm currently directing the Crisis on Dusky program at the Children's Mercy, uh, Kansas City. We're going to have a lot of pictures and some videos. So um, coming on with the next slide, please. So seeing here are the pictures of how the transit and the is done. The first picture is, is a setup of our uh, place with the throne that the patient's actually um, going to be sitting on. The patient will be provided with uh, numbing medication in both of their nostrils. They're going to sniff, sniff, and swallow. And so we also not just not numb just in the nose, and also numb in the back of the throat as well. So after the patients feel like they feel the lung in the throat, that when we know that um, everything is good to go, so we start a process. So as you can see, we we go in with a scope and we're gonna continue to communicate with the patients, make sure that they can breathe, make sure that they can um, swallow, um, and making sure that they, they, they're the most comfortable going through this. And before we move on to the next slide, I would like to warn everyone in the audience that we will be showing a video of my throat and my esophagus on the left side of the screen. So feel free to keep your eyes on the right if you think the video may scare you. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. So the left side of the video is my throat, my larynx sort of voice box. And it should be moving. Yes. So going into the esophagus, beautiful. And yes. So as you know, the transient endoscopy has been getting more and more interest, not just from the patients and families, but also among the physicians as well. We had multiple sessions that we practiced with each other and to learn not just how we can do it effectively, but also learn how we we it would feel having the scope through the nose and throat so we make sure that we can tell you exactly how it feels and and we would like to find a way to give our patients the best experience possible and as as you can see here on the pictures on the right side um with the evo endo the blue background you can see that these are the pictures that were taken at the largest meeting of the pediatric gi society called NASPEGAN just a couple of weeks ago and we were able to demonstrate the transnasal endoscopy by scoping each other. And there's so many people in the audience and I was able to scope Dr. Dr. Katie Baldi from uh, Children's Wisconsin. And also um, she was able to scope me back. So it, we, we had a lot of fun there. Yeah, next slide, please. And yep. And yeah, so at Children's Mercy Kansas City, we, we almost hit a year since we started because we actually started after the Evoendo got cleared by the FDA. And so far we have done more than 20 patients. We now selected only patients with EOE or eosinophilia esophagitis who are older than 10 years old. And I have to say that our TNEO Transnational Hospital Program couldn't have been this successful today with our whole team of people, Transnational Hospital Nurses, I love specialist team and thank you Kelly for being here today and a lot of people in, in the back who really come together and make sure that we deliver the best care to our patients. And thank you for being here today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Kresslet. Um, I would be remiss if I did not note also that while we are focused on eosinophilic GI disorders on the this particular call, 
in our partnership with App Fed and Cured, this is an actual endoscope and can be used for virtually anything that an uh, upper endoscopy, not absolutely everything that, that's to physician discretion, but there are many diseases that this scope can actually support. So um, for those out there that cross over into other disease areas um, or disorders, that uh, just to make note that um, that this, this scope does have multiple functions beyond EOE. Um, but it is very heavily used in that space, obviously, because of the, the number of uh, endoscopies that patients certainly go undergo. So with that and all of our introductions, I thank everybody for their intros. We are opening up now to questions, and I will field the first question that's been sent over to us. And it's actually a very valuable question. Um, do patients gag when the scope enters? What is that experience like? I'll certainly turn that over to the physicians who perform these. And uh, Dr. Ryan, why don't you go first in uh, discussing the experience of that? So, you know, yeah, it's possible they can gag. It's certainly something going down back there. But, um, you know, one of the reasons we do this transnasally is it, it kind of changes the angle that you're approaching the um, the pharynx at. So you're coming down straight from the nasal passage and down, and it makes it a little less noxious for the patient, as opposed to if you think about putting your finger in your mouth, it's a lot easier to gag yourself than when you're picking your nose. So while it is possible the patient's gag, it's incredibly well tolerated, and the scope is so thin and small, like, uh, like Clint was saying, it's like a little piece of spaghetti. And a lot of times I just ask the patient to swallow. I try to be very gentle and slow going through that area. I get into the position I want to go. And then once they start the swallowing motion, I try to slide right down with them. Um, so, so while yes, it is possible to gag, we try to minimize that as much as possible. Thank you so much for that. Um, anybody want to else want to chime in, Dr. Schroeder or Preslap? Anything to add? Yeah, so I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Ryan. And it, another thing that we can do to make sure that um, is a little bit more comfortable is to use a numbing medication. I think that that's something that is really helpful. I have um, I had the scope done with and without um, the medication, and I would say that the medication that we use in the nose and swallow in the throat, I think that medication is, is really helpful, and a lot of patients uh, to related the procedure really, really well. Yes. I, I will say that the um, lidocaine tends to be pretty bitter and foul tasting, so some don't actually gag during the procedure, but more gag as you're administrating the numbing <laughs> medication. And so um, we'll use in our practice um, a candy spray. It's allergen free um, and it's almost like banaca candy. So we'll spray their nose and then I try to mask it as much as possible with the candy spray. So it doesn't cause as much sort of involuntary gagging. And we do use um, a mister, um, it's called an atomizer, but it sort of mists the lidocaine in. Um, if you do a large amount, it can be like just reactively gagging. So I do find that's the more often time patients are gagging though. Thank you all. Um, and there's a handful of questions actually coming on uh, on biopsies. So we'll we'll start with uh, Dr. Krasilev on this one. Uh, multiple questions about how um, how are biopsies taken for an EG patient? Um, does the scope go far enough for this? And are the biopsies accurate? And are you able to take a number of biopsies to, answer, to kind of pull the questions together? So a lot of a lot of interest about biopsies, number of biopsies, and and does the scope go far enough? So Dr. Preslap, why don't you start with that? Yes, um, yes. So because the scope is very much like a like a regular EGD or the upper endoscopy under anesthesia, so if you would like to get biopsies in the stomach, you can definitely do that uh, with no problem. And the the quality of the biopsy is actually very. Uh, similar to the one that we would get from from uh, regular scope. Um, in terms of the stomach, we want to make sure that the patients may need to be uh, not having anything by mouth for a little bit longer than uh, two hours. Usually we do four hours for if you want to look into the stomach um, to make sure that there's no food there so we can really have a good look in the stomach. Um, and I feel like a lot of patients related it very well. Um, 
at our center, we, we don't really go much into the stomach just yet because we just started it. Um, but in the in the future, that's the planet we would like to go for. And we're going to plan to go to the small intestine as well. Thank you. Dr. Schroeder, Dr. Ryan, about biopsies or um, or the, the ability to take them. I don't, I, there's no limit to the number of biopsies you can take, certainly. Um, sure. So typically um, the working channel itself actually will fit our pediatric biopsy forceps. So if we were going to scope a child that was less than 10 kilos, we would use a working channel to fit the same exact um biopsy forcept. Um, so the biopsies themselves, you can see sometimes even deeper, like the lamina propria in some patients. Um, I will often try to take two bites at one time, just like I would do with a sedated endoscopy. Um, for EOE surveillance, I try to take at least six biopsies. So two in the distal and then two in the mid or I'll do sometimes three distal and then three mid-proximal um, areas um, from that standpoint. Yeah, and I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I found that the biopsies are more than adequate for, for management of VOE and other disorders. We are able to biopsy in the stomach and the esophagus. And the patients, you know, they, they I've had it described to me as a tug, pinch. One person felt that said it felt like his toenails getting clipped in his esophagus. I still gag a little bit with that one, but I mean, overall it's, it's pretty well tolerated. I found that I learned this technique again from Clint Smith and Joel Freelander that sometimes, you know, nonverbal cues because the patient's awake. So if you suddenly say open, close and tucks, they almost will brace themselves knowing that something's coming. So one of the biopsy techniques I'll use is either tapping my foot or clearing my throat. I'll go <clears throat> when I want them to open. And <clears throat> again, when I want the nurse to close the forceps and, um, uh, by doing that, the patient's not realizing they had biopsy, and many don't even realize it. And I did have one nurse think I had a tick because I was clearing my throat so much. But other than that, it's been a successful technique. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all for answering those. Um, I have a, a little bit more of a technical question here. Um, is t &E always done sitting upright, or can this be done left lateral? Any one of you, um, feel free. Dr. Schroeder, why don't you answer that one? I've been using, my patients have been upright. I've tried to do transgastric for kids that have had um, uh, G-tubes and I'll have them laying on their left lateral. I know that, that probably getting into the small bowel and having patients positioned on their left lateral side is more like what we would do in the OR. Um, but um, I've been mostly having my patients sit upright for their for their for me. Dr. Krasilat, you? Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. And I feel like the way we were trained so far, we were trained as the patient sitting up. So we're more comfortable with the, the anatomy going in. I feel like if we're going to do left side or laying down the anatomy might be a little bit different and we might need to intubate the scope a little bit differently. I, again, I have done it both ways on myself and I feel like doing it upright is actually much more comfortable and there's a lot less pressure in the throat and I would absolutely just advocate for doing it upright. Yes. And Dr. Ryan, your opinion on that? Yeah, I've only done it upright. I think it it also makes the patient feel a little bit more control um, than if they were laying down. And the, it, you you want to make them participants in this procedure and, and feel as comfortable as they can. I think if they were laying down and you're over them more, it might be a little less comfortable. And you are putting air in to kind of see where you're going so they could get a little burpy or refluxy. And I think sometimes sitting upright might help with that as well. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, 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 an interesting question here that certainly uh, pertains to this community uh, for many people is my son has an NG tube inserted when he was in middle school and it was very uncomfortable for him. Is this tube smaller and is the insertion easy, easier? So that comparison to the NG tube, which uh, which does come up in clinic quite a bit. Um, Dr. Kreslap, why don't you tackle that first if you don't mind? Yeah, I think it's going to be a little bit different. First, in terms of the size, the scope 3.5 um, millim millimeters would be around 12 French 
of the NG tube. So depending on the, the size of the, of the NG tube, but 12 fringes is very small. Uh, that's first. And second, usually when they do the NG tube insertion, they 10 French, yeah, sorry. Yes, 10 French. <laughs> usually when they do an N NG tube insertion, they most places they don't really put in the numbing medication. So that's another thing. This, this is something that we're gonna do differently. Um, and third, if you're thinking about it, if you if the patient's getting the NG tube placed, the person who plays it, they actually place it blindly. Like they don't know like where to go and it's hopefully it would go into the, the stomach, right? But if we the way we do it with the with the scope, we actually can see where we're going. We can try to go very gently and try not to knock things as we go. I think that would be less traumatic when it comes to um, comparing to the NG tube insertion. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions, so I'm going to keep going. Um, Dr. Schroeder, are there any reasons why transnasal wouldn't be a good option? Or, and are these scopes for all ages now for uh, uh, now for EG patients? So my experience has been, if a patient is not gonna tolerate nasal sprays and you sort of being in their nose or in their personal space, if they have like sensory things that way, they're not gonna cooperate for the procedure. Um, and so I've had some that haven't been able to, to even get like Afrin or the lidocaine in because they just wouldn't let me towards their nose. So usually that's sort of one of those questions I'll ask patients in the clinic, like, do you tolerate nasal sprays? Um, and if you've never had a nasal spray, can you practice with a nasal spray and see if you're okay with that? Um, and then from an age standpoint, um, I typically will do a really well, like distractible eight-year-old probably. And, um, if they can't follow directions, um, you know, or too anxious, sometimes we'll hold off and then we'll offer it the next time they needed their surveillance. So. I want the experience to be best possible because obviously these patients are getting frequent endoscopies to monitor disease activity or if we're changing treatment. And so I, I want to make sure that when we are doing it, that we can then do it again. So um, we'll really talk through that in clinic before I order it for them. Anyone, anything to add, Dr. Ryan? No, you know. I, I agree with what Sean is saying. I don't, you know, I I ask my I get a lot of referrals, so I don't even meet all of my patients before they come in for these procedures. And I think I don't have any absolute contraindications. I think the child has to be cooperative enough. Some kids that might be autistic or too anxious might be difficult. I've only gone down to seven years of age. I think, uh, you know, sometimes the kids could understand a little bit better. I think the key thing really, though, and just preparing if anybody's planning on doing this, um, just let your kid know that it's going to be done without sedation this time. I think the worst cases I've had is when the kid's coming to the to the procedure thinking, hey, I'm going to sleep again. And then suddenly, surprise, we're doing this without putting you. I think, you know, you got to trust that they're going to be able to comprehend and understand and be a participant in this procedure. So I, I do encourage the parents to talk about it with them. It's not like going to the beach or going to an amusement park. It's going to be a procedure. But overall, the, the kids tend to appreciate it. And then I do get a lot of return. Uh, at least half of my cases are return um, participants. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kraslapa, you yeah, I think you have something to add to that. Yeah. So I, I think from from Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Ryan like mentioned, I, I think that's that's very good point because I know that like all the families, all the parents so excited about this, right? But at the same time, we want to make sure that all the this decision that we're gonna be making, we wanna make sure that we involve the patients as well, right? And and we don't want to have again like we don't want to have the patients coming in and hoping to get the regular EGD under anesthesia and they kind of surprised on a day off because that's not how we want to start the day, right? And that's that's why I, I would say when you think about TNV like it's not just a day off. That's I would say that's probably like thirty percent, twenty percent of what we actually do for TNV. It's more like the prep that we are working with the patients and families ahead of time to get them to be ready for that day. I think that's the most important thing, and making sure that the kids are part of that. 
And that's why I really appreciate Chai Life, especially at our institution so much, because that's really making my job very much easier. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kreslav, why don't you continue on? I have a question about, um, uh, do you have any other post-op precautions or pre-op precautions, medications for nausea that you feel you need to prescribe um, after they've had the procedure? Um, so first, um, I wanna make sure that the patient can swallow safely before we send the patient home because again, we use the numbing medications and sometimes they lose the sensation of how they swallow. They feel like they couldn't swallow. Things may feel a little bit weird. So we want to make sure they are able to swallow safely before they go home. So that's why Lifeless Schroeder said that we always often give give them some popsicles to make sure that they're okay. They're able to swallow okay before they, we send them home. Second, um, and I know that some um some people in the audience can ask about complications as well, because this one is going through a nose. So in rare occasion, there might be some some um uh, complication in terms of like nose bleeds, nose bleeds, which can be in some data can be up to 3.5%, which is pretty rare. And most of them pretty much you can just stop it at home just with some compression or with the ice pack and not really anything serious that we have seen so far. So it's very well correlated with very uh, minimal complications. And in terms of nausea medications, we don't really need that because a lot of patients correlated it very well. We we often use a CO2 and, and at the end of the procedure, patients do fine after with no, no concern with nausea. Yeah, there was another uh, half to that question, which I can certainly, um, Dr. Schroeder, um, do you use free air or CO2 for insufflation or is that institution dependent? I think it's institution dependent. We were talking about it. If I'm going to be doing, I think, more gastric and small bowel intubation with the scopes, I probably will switch over to CO2. Um, this is what we use downstairs in the endo suite. Currently, right now, I have air um, upstairs because I'm doing it in the outpatient clinic setting. I'm not doing it in the aerodigestive center. And um, Dr. Ryan, I'm going to ask you uh, um, another question that's come in is, and it's a three-parter. So <laughs> um, the, the uh, one, one parent wants to know, is this covered by insurance? Do you have to use the numbing spray? And how long does this procedure last? How long is it? All right. So the procedure, if it's just straight esophageal biopsies, it's often just six minutes. Maybe if you want the stomach, eight minutes. It's fast. Like uh, I can't remember which one of my colleagues was saying, you don't want to, it might have been Clint, don't want to watch a movie. You want to watch like a, a trailer almost. I mean, it's it's a six to eight minute procedure. Um, do you have to use the numbing spray? I've had it done three times to me. Um, and the middle time I did not use the numbing um, spray. It was okay. And I've had one of my patients ask not to use the numbing spray because they felt it was the biggest gagging, gross thing they had. It's it's not required, like like Dr. Kressler was saying, is, you know, we put NG tubes down without it. You could do it. And honestly, I think we have, it's easier for us to place this than it is an NG tube because we can see where we're going. So, no, you're not required to use the numbing. We use a numbing gel. Um, so the kids have to snort it up the nose a little bit, swallow a little bit. And then we have them blow their nose a few minutes later. What that does is it also lubricates everything up a little bit. So I think we get some better slide and less resistance. Uh, with the gel we use, the lidocaine gel that we use. Um, and does insurance cover it? Of course, uh, they do. It's The families have not been getting billed for this. The insurance covers both the, the disposable scope at our institution and they cover the cost of the esoph esophagoscopy, I guess. It's not it's not as the same billing as an EGD, but no, it is covered by pretty much universally by all the insurances, uh, at least out of Philadelphia. Dr. Schroeder, anything to add? I would agree. And... Um... There are, we have not had any um, billing issues as of recently and the hospital is getting paid. So they are happy. It's freeing up OR time for um, other more complex patients that need to be sedated. Um, and so um, this has been a great tool, I think, not just for families, but just the medical system in general, because the cost is significantly less compared to a sedated endoscopy. And that was actually another one of the questions. Dr. Kresselep, I see you nodding your head. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I I think I agree with, with Dr. Ryan and Dr. Schroeder that we so far, we don't have any problem with insurance coverage. So far, everything seems to be 
um, going well. And what are the other two questions again? Oh, how long? Right? So right now, um, we up to five to 10 minutes. Yeah, so it's, it's very short. If you play some music, it would be less than three songs. So it's pretty, very doable. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'm going to switch gears here. Um, we have a, a question, certainly a topic I'm I'm very passionate about, which is transition of care as well as the uh, adult population in pediatrics. So we have a parent who, uh, or a patient, uh, I'm not sure which, but somebody has asked, um, I've been seeing this offered in the pediatric population. I wonder why adult GIs are not open to the offering. Um, and I can certainly answer part of that is that many of them are, are have some interest in this. Um, I have discussed with my own GI and she is hesitant. My son's PDGI is ready to get trained and excited about it, but why do they have different outlooks? So um, it, I'll, I'll open that up to all three of you because there's very different perspectives between your hospitals and the approach of adult care and um, and some of the, the sharing of adult patients. And so I'll actually start with Dr. Schroeder because I know that you have, and you know I'm going to call on you because I have, uh, I have observed adults being sent into your practice from some of your adult colleagues in the area for patients who have aged out of pediatrics into the adult space coming back to you. So please, if, if you could start with that one. Yeah, I guess it's odd when I have like my patient coming in with their girlfriend that they're living with and they have a full-time job. And um, yeah, I, I think this is a struggle in general for transitioning our patients um, that I struggle with especially now that I offer these less invasive ways to do surveillance um, is trying to get by. And it depends on the system that's your adult system. So we have a lot of private practices in Phoenix, as well as then I have colleagues that are at the Mayo Clinic, which obviously is another huge medical system. So getting any new product into a new system, especially if it's a smaller practice or even a large practice can be challenging and they have to be able to put a business plan together or show that this is going to be profitable, especially if they're in private practice. Um, I think in pediatrics, we generally are looking for best solutions to avoid anesthesia as often as possible because we are de dealing with developing brains. Um, a lot of times when I ask my adult GI colleagues, they swear that their patients just want to be sedated for everything and they have no desire to be awake for it, um, which I, I don't necessarily believe it's probably based on the way that they're presenting the option for transnasal, because my guess is if they could go back to work or be able to drive there or back themselves, why wouldn't you want to do it awake? Um, so I, I've been struggling with that in general, but I do have patients that will be seen by adult colleagues um, that were previously patients of mine. So um, that will come back and get scoped by me as a technician. And then I will send the biopsy results back to the adult provider and they will interpret that. Um, on a side note, I was asked by one of my adult colleagues just last week if I would scope a pregnant woman who had EOE, and that did not go well with risk management at my hospital. Um, so there was just a little bit more involved in that. But again, it's a very low risk procedure. And so I'm happy to scope anyone. Um, and, and now that I do realize that my adult colleagues are not offering this, I sort of feel like I want to keep my patients longer as well. And so um, I'm not so quick. If my patients are willing to go through an unsedated procedure, I'm not as quick as to send them off into the adult world, um, to be honest. I don't know about you guys, um, but just my thoughts. Um, Dr. Krasilap or Dr. Ryan? Your thoughts about transition and the uh, the disconnect, perhaps um, I'm not sure if that's the best word, but the uh, the the difference of uh, the excitement around transnasal endoscopy, um, the pediatric population certainly seems to be at, um, very excited about this, and it's um, maybe not quite as robust in the adult space. Um, Dr. Kraslap, I, I saw you come off mute, please. Yeah, so so I have to agree with Dr. Schroeder. I feel like we often look into things that we can improve care for the 
patients, like with the developing their brain and all these things, you have child life and all the support teams really help the patients going through these things. But adult care, they try to get things so fast and sometimes they don't have time to really try to find a way and, and look at things like differently, like what we would do. And I think um, to get, so when adult or um, GI, when they look at endoscopy, when they talk about transnasal endoscopy, they look at the transnasal endoscopy that's specifically designed for adults. And a lot of those um, scopes are very big. And, and like Clint was showing uh, before, it was five point something, which is huge, very big. And I'm not sure how much they, they are aware of the new product that comes out as an evil endo, that we now have something very small and, and the same length as an EGD, I feel like. And, and that's why having a webinar or town hall like this is very important because we can spread the words. And I feel like this would be something that not just us pushing, trying to get this spread to other people, but if it comes from the patients and families, that this would would go a long way as well to 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 get the words out there that hey, doctors, you know, like we have, I heard Evo and Doe is like very small scope and and very long, good enough, and and it's very small. Like, can we maybe try that? And if you wanna learn, um. We know that there are so many people that we can maybe connect you with. I think that would that would go a long way and really help not just your families but also help other families as well. And Dr. Ryan on transition and the and the adult and pediatric spaces. I have, a, I have a different take. I think the adults a very interesting colonoscopies. There's a lot of cancer screening, polypectomies. The money is in the colon. Um, so this has not been an emphasis and a driver. I think their business model is different than PEDS. Uh, I, I think PEDS was the leader on a lot of these EGIDs initially, and the adults had to catch up a little bit. If you remember the history of like how EOE came about, and I think it's going to be the same situation here. I think the business model will change for the adult GIs when they realize their nurse practitioners or physician assistants might be able to perform this in the or office. And that's a low hanging fruit because then there's suddenly money coming in and it's not tying up the MD time. So you'll see it, but I think it's going to be a different model than what we do in PEDS because they're going to want this to be a procedure that could be done by a nurse practitioner. But I think they've just been slower to adapt because their their business model is driven by colon. Yes, and then there there is a business to medicine um, as much as it's it's a difficult topic to discuss sometimes for all of us. So um, we did have a question about whether we were FDA approved for pre-existing EGID indications, diagnosis, or can it be used for other GI diseases? I would like to answer that myself in that I had mentioned earlier and certainly am, uh, and reiterating that um, it is not just for eosinophilic disorders. It's a, it's a scope first. It's an endoscope. And so there are many things that the scope can be used in uh, celiac disease, H. pylori, any number of things that you would be going in, even just, uh, you know, reflux or um, a patient that has chronic stomach pain that they're not sure. And the physician wants to do a scope. Um, they, they would be able to use our scope for that. There's there's many things that you could do, and it does take biopsies. So those can be sent off. So it is a scope first. It's just that the eosinophilic community does undergo multiple scopes sometimes in a year. And so that's a lot of anesthesia. So that is uh, a big reason why this has caught on so heavily in the eosinophilic PI community, unless anybody has anything to add to that um, in our... Oops, apologies, I did wanna address that. So um, shifting gears on that one, um, complications. Have you seen any complications from T&E? Um, let's start with Dr. Ryan. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Kreslov had mentioned sometimes uh... A nosebleed, no serious complications. I, I have not had, you know, knock on wood, any kind of perforations or anything more serious. I had had a uh, maybe three patients now pass out. I guess it went from a, a conscious procedure <laughs> to an unconscious procedure. We do stop the procedure in that situation. I had one mother pass out. I don't know if I could count that as a complication of the TNE. Uh, everybody was okay after this, so no serious complications. Um, you know, sometimes vomiting. That's that's probably the most common complication. Uh, but, but no severe bleeding, no perforations, um, no aspirations from it. Dr. Schroeder? I agree with what Dr. Ryan said. Um, 
I had a nosebleed just on Friday. Um, and I, when I came out, I said, do you get nosebleeds frequently? Yes. When was your last one? Last night. And I was like, why did you have me go down that nostril that I just went down? Because, um, but that was probably my first um, nasal bleeding. I do Afrin prior to doing the lidocaine. So that actually decreases vascular flow and opens up the nasal passages. Um, but yes, our patients tend to be allergic. They have lots of swollen turbinates. So sometimes getting through the turbinates or even swollen adenoids um, can be challenging. Um, but no, I have not had any, thank God, any major complications. And Dr. Kraslap? Yeah, I, I would have to agree with that. I don't have anything major. Like, I mean, even nosebleeds, I don't have any patients having uh, any complaints of nosebleeds. There may be some occasions that the patients may come back that, oh, I after the t &E, I had um sinus infection, kind of like that, but it was like way back, like, it's not it's probably not related to the e and T and E and then some people they're just so excited about anything so they kind of thought that things kind of related um but yeah so at the end we we felt that something like that is probably not related because it's it's way after the procedure yes thank you thank you and um apart from the extra time and effort required um for sedated um do you feel, and this is a little bit of a broad question, um, the, the potential for a percentage of cost savings to either families, insurance, or even sort of the, the burden to society, so we, so we would speak, you know, um, I don't know if any of you have comments on that. It's a question in the group, and I certainly, um, it, it's a little bit of, I guess I should preface this, that hospitals have different contracts with different insurance companies and things like that, so everybody's going to be completely different. And it's going to come down to your plan, um, but the the potential for cost savings, Dr. Ryan, you've come off mute. I'll I'll pick on you. <laughs> oh yeah, this was a big, you know, when you put together a plan for this, because I was like, oh my gosh, are we going to lose money on this? Are we going to reimburse the thing? There, it's it's much less expensive for the insurance companies. Hopefully for the families. You got to remember, we are taking anesthesia out of the picture, so you're not paying for that physician anymore. So you lost anesthesia time. You've taken it out of a procedure room. So you now reduce the procedure room time for a procedure. There's no recovery room time. A child doesn't go back to a PACU or a recovery room after as they walk out of the building. These are all big cost savings um, for for the um, for the insurance companies, I guess. Um, you know, you still have your pathology costs. You still have your endoscopist costs. You still have some some equipment costs to it. But I would say, and again, it varies from institution to institution based on contracts and stuff. But our procedure about four or five times less expensive than a standard EGD. Uh, Dr. Schroeder? I would agree with that, um, all of that actually. Um, I, I actually think um, doing this procedure actually takes a little bit more time from the endoscopist standpoint because your patients are awake, right? They're talking to you. You have to walk them through it. So from like a physical standpoint, at the end of the day, me doing eight or nine transnasals, I'm exhausted. Whereas I could spend a day, full day in the OR and do 16 or 18 procedures and I'm I, I'm still ready to get on my Peloton. So um, I feel like um, it's a little bit more physically draining as the endoscopist to do it, but I, I do love doing the procedures for for the patients that are are looking for an alternative, um, and there is a significant cost savings to the the medical system in general. Anything to add, Dr. Kreslap? No. Nope. Okay. Um, moving on. Um, I I think I can probably answer um, some of this. Um, there there are, it's the question is so are there twelve hospitals that now offer T and E all pediatric? There's actually more than 12 now. I think we're approaching 20. They are all pediatric at current, but we do have several hospitals that ha are with adults that are coming soon. Um, it is an anonymous attendee. I will answer you. Um, I can, I, I'd be happy to speak with you um, about where some of those adult locations are. They're not online yet, so I don't want to necessarily put them on the spot, uh, given that they're not live yet. 
but we would be happy to work with you in hopefully finding one that's near you that uh, we will have some adult providers relatively soon. And we are working with um, several adult hospitals uh, um, coming soon. So if uh, if we can uh, respond to you privately, we can we can certainly seek um, to try to direct you to some support. So um, coming on uh, from that, uh, next question, is there a specific NAIR always used for T&E? And um, this is a fun little question because I, I've observed so many of these now. Um, for repeat T&E, do you use the same NAIR or do you alternate back and forth? So Dr. Kreslap, why don't you tackle that one? Yes, so um, usually before we start um, doing the procedure, I would ask the patient to blow their nose first and see what side kind of more open and we'll go with that side or and I also ask them if they have any issues with nosebleeds or like no surgery or something in um any side specifically if nothing we can just go um either way yes anything to contribute Dr. Ryan no I totally agree we asked the patient what's side feels more open and then we put lidocaine gel in it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, any, well, from that, Dr. Ryan, we will move on to the next question, which is what are the side effects for sniffing lidocaine multiple times for multiple procedures? Are there any and what are they? Yeah, so, you know, that's a great question. We limit the amount of lidocaine we use because there are cardiac side effects. There could be arrhythmias that occur with too much lidocaine. Yeah, how much is getting absorbed and swallowed? Hard to say, but our pharmacy puts a cap on how much of the gel we're able to give. I do hit a ceiling on how much I can use, so we are sensitive to that. Um, so yeah, it's not not without risk. That said, we do have a pulse ox on, and we are kind of monitoring things a little bit while the procedure's going. We haven't had any complications from the lidocaine. It's a 2% gel that we use, and I think the atomizer might be a 4%. Yep, and Dr. Sharder's nodding her head, and so is Dr. Krasilev. I believe you're both using 4% lidocaine. And uh, and they do limit the amount um, based on weight to ensure the safety of the patient and the absorption, et cetera. So, um, and, and actually, I, would, um, I, I had a question that I had uh, posed for all three of you in that um, all three of you have actually had a transnasal endoscopy done. So um, e each of you, please take a moment to, um, A, why did you have it done? And B, what was the procedure like? Dr. Shorty, you go first. Sure. So um, the philosophy of like, watch one, do one, teach one. So that's um, sort of what happened one day. We all paired off and um, one of my partners, I'm trying to teach him how to do transnasal endoscopy. And so I let him, I be the, I was the first patient for him. So uh, I also really wanted to see what my patients were going through um, and how bitter really was the lidocaine and what was the experience like. And really um, I felt like the worst part for me was the lidocaine. It just made me gag um, and my nose was very numb. The back of my throat was very numb. Obviously, my partner did not take biopsies in me, so I still don't know what that feels like. Um, but it was a really great learning experience. And then I'm able to actually talk to my patients about my experience as well. Um, obviously, that will be individualized from patient to patient, but just like overall what m my experience was. So, and my partner did great. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kresslep, and what about you? And I think it's wonderful that the physicians are having this procedure, by the way. I, as, as an advocate, as a parent, um, I have not had the procedure myself. I certainly would, would be very happy to undergo it, but I, I think it's wonderful all of you have done this. Dr. Kresslep, what was your experience like? Yeah, so um, I first, I wanted it to be done on me because I really wanted to know, like Dr. Trotter said, like, what it's like so I can better explain to the patients and I feel like I had it done and I, I learned what would be the best way to make it best experience for them and that's how I learn and, and try to tailor how we approach and, and come up with a method that is best for the patients what it's like I wouldn't I don't think I 
I, I, I wouldn't say it's painful. It's not painful, but it can be a little bit of discomfort. I would think of it as, um, when you put in lidoc lidocaine, um, the numbing medication is uh, almost like you put in flonase. I'm not sure if you have had like a nasal spray. It's kind of like that, and that's the same way with aphrin as well. But when you put um the scope in the nose, it's almost like when you do um. Um, the COVID testing, but not that I would say it's much less than the COVID testing because COVID testing you don't really have any numbing medication. This is you can feel it going in, but it's not painful. It's not like a poking pain, but you're gonna feel some pressure going in. You're gonna feel it. Not that you're not gonna feel anything. You're gonna feel it, but it's not gonna be painful or like pokey pain like that. Yeah, and I think um I was able to have it done on me with my partners and and the fellows uh, being trained to do um transnasal endoscopy. So hopefully in the future, we have more people to be able to do this. And Dr. Ryan, how was your transnasal? Like I said, I've had it done uh, three times, basically for training purposes. I've had a mirror up or somebody using a, a screen to reflect back so I could see the screen of where they were going and what they were doing, because you could talk during the whole thing. So it was fine. The lidocaine, the gel is different than a nasal spray. It's like snorting up a stuffed nose, what you tell your kids never to do. You kind of snort and swallow. Um, I kept thinking I was drooling because I couldn't feel myself swallowing my spit. So I think I was touching my chin all the time and saying, sorry, but I wasn't drooling. I was able to swallow my spit. It's pressure. Uh, I think Dr. Kressler was right. It's just you feel like a little pressure in the back of the throat and maybe the back of the nose. It's not it's not painful, but it's sometimes it's a little discomfort to it. I mean, the numbing stuff is not perfect. Um, and I've had it done mainly because my hospital won't let me do it on nurses or fellows. They feel that's coercion. They feel I'm in a higher position of authority. So I said, well, heck, I'm, then if I'm the top of the totem pole, I'll let people do it on me. Um, and I plan to continue to do that. I'm just waiting now to think, I think the next time I have it done, I probably will get biopsy just to kind of experience that so I can tell my patients exactly what that feels like. Thank you so much. And I'm actually going to direct to our Clint Smith, who's actually had five of these and can certainly speak to this. He's observed well over a thousand and he's had <laughs> five of them. <laughs> I mean, exactly what all, all the other providers here have, have said is, you know, to be involved with so many myself and watch these kids and talk these kids all the way through it to finally be able to say this was what the experience was like was amazing. Also to to allow the providers who are doing this on each other to to learn and understand because you know the times I've had it done um, all within a few weeks span. So frequently getting lidocaine again, no issues. And as they've all said, it, it's bitter, it's medicine, but it is what it is. Um, it was definitely a good experience, but also a learning experience for the provider. So it was good for me, but it was also for, for the providers doing it because there is a lot of, of nervousness for I think some of their first times because they're used to the patients being a, a sleep um and not not talking back and stuff so yeah so it's it's pressure um and when i had it done the provider was doing it for a longer period of time to learn and get more experiences and and i think one time was over 20 minutes um just as they were figuring things out and during that whole time just some pressure and you know watching the vr i actually pulled, pulled my phone out and facetimed with my family to show my four-year-old twins what was going on and um so so yeah so it's it's good for providers nurses, doctors to understand exactly what these patients are going through to to let them know. And as I, I've spoken with all these providers and their teams, there should be no secrets involved with with T E, letting the patients know exactly what to expect and what's going to happen can really help have a, a better experience and, and get them through it. And nine times out of ten patients do it and do just fine. So thank you so much for, for that, Quinn. I'm I'm a huge proponent of education. I think it demystifies this and uh, makes it that much, the more you know, the better off you're going to do tends to be my mantra. And we do have a, a family who commented in the uh, in the chat that they are a patient of Dr. Schroeder's and they're very grateful that you brought this to uh, to Phoenix Children. So thank you for that. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll wind up with our, our final question. Um, how would each of you Explain this procedure to a family who really wants to do to do this to avoid anesthesia, but they're really not sure their child can do it, and they're a little bit scared. So, Dr. Sher, why don't you you tackle that first, and um, we'll let each one of you, as our final question, speak to that about how you have this conversation with a family who's interested but but kind of scared, and they're not sure their child can get through it. So, we do have some um, handouts from our education center that we've provided families. 
Um, and it does refer to the Evo Endo website where you can actually watch. Um, sometimes I'll direct them to the YouTube channel that Dr. Friedlander put together, even at Children's Colorado, to even see what it looks like in general. Um, we haven't put our own video yet together, but <laughs> regardless, um, I also have some families that are more than willing to talk to other families um, about their experience. So if they wanted to talk to the patient or the parent that they've volunteered um, to answer those questions um, if they're interested, but sort of on the fence. And then again, um, I just talked to the patient in general and explain again, the risks of anesthesia um, and, you know, benefits of being able to, you know, come in only having not eaten for two hours, um, being able to go back to school or their activities, like back to wrestling practice or swim practice later that night. Um, and so, you know, they'll sit and talk about it um, and then make that decision. And again, I tell them there's no pressure if they don't want to do it now that they can um, reassess. And I'm going to ask them every single time they come back to visit me the next year, if they're ready to do it at that point in time. And uh, uh, Dr. Kraslev, how do you how do you have this conversation with your families? Yeah, so I try to um, tell them exactly. Like again, like we don't want to have any secrets, right? We want to make sure that they know exactly what they're going through. And I feel like the best way to really um, tell them is to show them the video. And even though really put like really good. Um, very informative video on the website, and I really like everyone to to get a chance to really go in and really look at the at the video. If you type, I believe it's on YouTube as well, right? Is if you type in YouTube Evo Endo Translator Endoscopy, that should be the video that you you can see, and I think it has a very good information. And not just the parents watching, I really encourage you to have your children, your child watch it as well, so they know exactly what's, what's, what's going to happen on a day off. Yes. And another, another thing is, um, um, again, like we have the team of Child Life who can actually reach out to the families and, and really give them a run through of what's going to happen and really try to find a coping uh, strategy that works best for your child. Yes. And Dr. Ryan, final thoughts on that? You know, you know, everybody's worried about like, what if my kid doesn't like, what if they can't tell it? What if they can't? There's no rule that says you can't go back to anesthesia afterwards. So I try to say, give the kids some credit, give it a shot. I go back to what I said earlier, let them know it's going to be awake and it's going to be different and prepare them ahead of time. It shouldn't be a surprise that day. And again, if they don't like it, the next time they can go back to sleep if they want. But if they do, you've opened up a new door for them. And that's the way I look at it. And it's an opportunity. I think it's safer more cost effective and just better patient care. So I, I encourage it. And that's how I promote it to the families. I do encourage them to watch the videos, but I let them know that they hate just because you chose to go down this path this time doesn't mean you can't go back to the usual way. Or back and forth. You can or do back both. and forth. <laughs> you can absolutely do both. Absolutely. And, and with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for being on this. There's uh, we do have a patient portal. If you have additional questions, you can certainly reach out via our patient portal on the evowindow.com website. Um, there, there is additional information about the procedure. You can always contact us. Um, our reps are certainly here and available to direct you to the hospitals that are closest to you, the providers that are performing this procedure. And we are adding new hospitals in an ongoing fashion. Um, Dr. Kresslev, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Schroeder, Kelly, um, uh, Ellen, and uh, Kathleen from uh, Appet and Cured, you've all been wonderful partners in bringing this whole thing together. And we hope that this is the first of many educational um, town hall meetings that we will be having to come. And so we, we're very grateful for your time. So thank you all very much for participating. And as a reminder, we will be sending out this recording via email in the coming days. And uh, for more information, please stop by the website. Um, and again, my contact information was on this and you're certainly free to contact me and I can certainly put you in touch with the folks in your area. 
Um, and with that, uh, we will be ending the recording, which means that this will be going off very rapidly. And then you will, your surveys will pop up. And we certainly appreciate the feedback so that we can continue to evolve these to everything that you need to make the most informed decisions for your families. So thank you all very much this evening. Have a wonderful night. Mm -hmm.